Welcome to the Vigor Life Podcast, a source of inspiration, lessons, stories, skill sets, mindsets, and strategies to invigorate and expand all areas of your life. Let's go. What's going on? Coach Luca back here with the Vigor Life Podcast. And today in the studio, none other than my brother from my actual mother, Matei Pacheva. Notice how I said that last name. You know, the way that we actually say it is, you know, we, call, we say Hosevar, but, but it's really Kuchivar. But I'm not going to tangle your tongue up. But since, since we're here on the show today with my brother, I can say it that way. Um, and, you know, so my, my brother's visiting from, he just went to, on a trip to Hawaii uh, with, uh, with his girl and came by for, for a couple of days. So the, the, the irony is that we have still not yet shot the podcast, uh, although we have... Uh, you know, hung out quite often, and uh, we said we got to do it. So I said, you know what? The first thing we do when he flies in, we're gonna shoot this podcast. And one of the things that's tough to do uh, with my brother is that you know the the there's many topics to talk about, but there's a couple of things that I certainly will touch on today. Actually, yeah, because the question is more so for him. Uh, you know, tell like tell everybody a little bit about what you do because you do a, a number of things. But you know, the we we started the gym. Um, Actually, the, the Vigor Ground Gym, and it wasn't called that back then, and I've told this story quite a few times. We first started in Slovenia, which is probably now 12, going on 13 years, 12, 13 years. Uh, my timeline is shitty about that. Um, in a room, and so that's where we started. Um, you know, uh, I kind of, I bugged him to, to invest into some kettlebells and, and stuff that we had in, in this room, and that was the beginnings, essentially. Um, and then, you know, now that gym in Slovenia is actually... Uh, we have we have uh, almost 400 members there. Is, is doing really well, uh, and he he runs a bunch of programs there. Obviously, um, almost part of the gym, and uh, but there's a lot of things that he does. So I'm gonna actually like I'm gonna ask you what what do you actually do? Can you answer this quite? Can you do an elevator pitch? about what you actually do? Well, I Let don't actually do much, but um, first of all, <laughs> there you go. <coughs> yeah, no, seriously though, it's a pleasure to be on. Uh, I was going to give you a lot of shit about uh, how long it took me, or rather, how long it took you to bring it's me like onto the show. 60 episodes, man. <coughs> yeah, <laughs> just about 60 episodes in uh, since you started it, but <coughs> no, seriously, it's a pleasure to be on, uh, and it's a pleasure to, to talk about the stuff <coughs> that we do. Obviously, listen to a lot of your stuff, and uh, you seem to have a whole host of people on here uh, speaking at, about not just obviously fitness but, and the fitness business, but all kinds of stuff. And uh, well, since you asked me, the last five years or so, I'd say I've really moved m more back into coaching. So, I, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's a pleasure to say that I'm first and foremost a coach these days. So, most of the uh, people I train now are either developing, which is like youth uh, players, soccer players, or uh, professional soccer players, uh, so senior players. Um, obviously, I don't just <clears throat> limit myself to, to soccer, but that's... It has I, become I, the niche somewhere. Yeah, yeah, very much so. <clears throat> and maybe I'll uh, expand on that a little bit later, uh, later on. But yeah, I've, I've also got some uh, volleyball players, uh, beach volleyball, actually, a uh, bit of basketball, a bit of handball, but yeah, m uh, predominantly soccer. And... Um, also, some some semi-private clients that I still uh, stick with, and I've got a group of guys who've been with me for like eight <coughs> eight years, and I really don't want to let them go. So they're they're like a, my small group, uh, and I work with them three times a week. But um, I do have an, uh, another business. Uh, it's a language business, so we uh, we do all kinds of stuff, uh, mostly legal uh, translations, uh, interpreting services, all that kind of stuff, and that kind of helped me traveled world and and see all the places that i've been to and uh, gain all the valuable experiences that ultimately transferred really well into my coaching business and um so that's where i'm at now i guess uh, the translation business runs itself pretty well and uh, as you well know you've got to have good people um in in your business if you want if you want it to to be sustainable and uh, run itself so to speak it never really runs itself like you you well know but um i don't really have to be there uh, most of the time uh, for it for it to run smoothly uh on the other hand big round in in ljubljana slovenia is uh, is doing well like you said we were up to almost 400 members now um i'd say I'm, my numbers are not great as well but i'd say like maybe 15 percent of those are, are athletes so i think this is something that we're developing quite well that we're getting uh, 
uh, known for quite well. So developing athletes, especially the young guys. Um, so uh, it's the, the good thing in our team is we have a really like, diverse group of, of people. So we have, you know, former basketball players in the form of uh, Marco and Giga. Um, you know, I'm a former so- soccer player. We've got Brana, who's a former uh, handball player. Danny with the martial arts. Gregor with the uh, powerlifting. Uh, Urshka with her mobility work. Um, and Nusha, who's a former CrossFit. Uh, you know, I could go on and on. It's uh, it's a really good good group of guys. Andraj with uh, his uh, freestyle skiing, all kinds of experience in there. So it's it's a really good fit. Um, you know, obviously we're not, not the best fit for uh, everyone. But I do think we can help uh, anyone. So, so how, much do, how much do you think that uh, uh, you know the because for most people don't know you, you know you, you played soccer, you played pro, you know I would say even up to the pros through college, everything. How much of an influence is, is that? That you know, uh, I, I would I would even say like how did you tie into you know training the soccer players? I think this is important, uh, and and you know you could replace this with whatever any niche, but. The, the fact that, you know, you played soccer and then obviously went into the strength and conditioning field and now you're training a lot of soccer players, you know, what opened the doors to like make those connections and, and have that? Because, uh, you know, I, I do want to bring to light a lot of the players that you've you've coached. I mean, they're, you know, have been getting some really big contracts, like young players that have been getting, you know, even a uh, million euro, multi-million euro contracts now. Um, you know, and I wanted to bring that to light, but like what opened the door for those guys to start coming in to train and trust because that's a big thing, right? With pro athletes and even developing athletes, I would say. <clears throat> For sure. Well, I'd start with saying, you know, admitting that, you know, it's really difficult to to say, you know, um, this guy signed the multi-million con- uh, the euro dollar contract because of me, you know, no, but ab- absolutely obviously yet, you, yeah. you're, you're just one part of the, part of the larger puzzle. But um, I think it's a couple of things. It's obviously in environment and culture and, um, Back home, I'd say it's a little bit. I how would I put it? It's it's a little bit more important, or at least it was maybe five, ten years ago that um, you actually played the game if you wanted to coach people, even as a strength and conditioning mm-hmm. coach, because <clears throat> there's su- uh, such a I'd say a disconnect bet- between the essence, uh, I'd say conventional SNC coach and a and a soccer player, uh, strength and conditioning, especially. Uh, in our environment has only come into the frame in the last, I'd say, five years or so, really. And even even now, you know, we, we still have a lot of the soccer guys, soccer coaches as well, so the, uh, the, the sport coaches who really, you know, because they don't understand strength and conditioning um, well, they they're kind of scared of it or rather, you know, they don't like the S&C coaches um, kind of, you know, uh, treading on their turf. So... It took a while to kind of convince people that it's it's valuable what we do, um, and I think obviously me being a former player kind of opened the door. And uh, when I started out, a lot of the guys who I was training was actually were actually players that I'd previously played with, or at least played with uh, at a junior level or uh, just. Uh, below the senior level so you know they they knew what I was about they knew I was uh, quite a physical player when I was uh, when I was still playing so um, you know they were kind of intrigued about what I was doing and obviously with time and with all the uh, education and experience uh, I've gained obviously changed the way I train uh, these guys um, expanded I'd say the port- portfolio um, but I think first and foremost it's been about uh, you know basically creating the relationships and explains to the guys slowly, you know, giving them chunks of information, not too much, and but basically showing them that it's a long game if uh, if they want to play it, uh, which is sometimes difficult with the with the guys who are you know 18, 19, 20. They want to they're exposed to all this um, uh, training stuff online now with you know the likes of Cristiano Ronaldo. You know, there's a lot of stuff about the way they recover from matches, the way they prepare for matches, but. You know, I think it's very dangerous because they only get a glimpse of what the whole training process actually is. So I, I guess my job is kind of to fill in the blanks for them. So and uh, uh, maybe one more thing that's, I mean, arguably 
the most important thing here is communication with the because you, as I said you're just a part of the puzzle and back home it's very rare that um, clubs have a designated SNC coach so you may be training some someone twice a week in season but you know you can't train them properly if you don't know their schedule in the club and so mm-hmm. you have to you have to get the player to trust you to to tell you everything that they've done in the club because uh, sometimes the young players they'll come in they'll just want to train and uh, if you're just loading them onto the load that they've already been subject to in the club you're not really doing them a favor uh, quite the opposite so there's a, a couple of, I mean number of lessons here that that you know I'm seeing because I always try to extract things um, for people to apply I mean for anybody that's a coach that's listening um, but even, even if you're not if you run any type of business you know one you know relationships I, I just did a, you know a podcast on obviously the network and relationships and how and then this guy's stealing my my uh, bang energy drink which is man if you weren't my brother shit would be going down right now um, but, <laughs> but but it's you know bridging because I kind of bridging the gap you know opening the door um, I, I would say most people don't take advantage of their network you know everybody's built up a certain level of relationships and skill sets um, and don't use it. And I think that you've done a good job, like going back and going uh, and opening that door. But it's taken some time. Like I mean, now I, I would say that uh, you know, as you certainly hear about the the, the soccer program at Vigor being um, probably one of the top programs, um, you know, in the nation for for developing soccer players. And you've kind of created that niche for yourself. But it's but it's taken some years to get there. So I I, I want to kind of make that point. Number one, like you can start now. You know, you whatever the niche is, if it's sports performance, it's something else. You know, get your foot in the door and start communicating. Bridge that gap, especially if it's sports, like earning the trust of the coaches, kind of always giving value. Same thing with the players, like earning trust, delivering value, showing them that you can help them improve their performance. Um, and one thing that I, I want to um, actually bring to light here, and I know if you, you've done this, you maybe haven't mentioned it, but do it a lot, is um, we call it results in advance, right? You see our 30-day program results in advance, which is really just a trial. But what results in advance means to me is this, okay? So if a player comes in and sees you and their hip is bugging them, right? And you do an assessment, you take them through some, you know, soft tissue drills and some mobility drills and maybe something else, some PRI, some DNS, and they go like, man, my hip doesn't hurt anymore, right? To me, that's results in advance. Now, that guy just went from, hey, this has been bugging me for like two months. Yeah, I can play, but it's, it's fucking bugging me. Now they're leaving and it's like, you know what? I don't feel that anymore. Guess what? Like you just gave them results in advance and now it's like, okay, come and back, come back in. You yeah. I mean? And it's almost a, a sales pitch, I'd say for the, for the athletes, because you know, what, what brings the athletes in, right? It's, it, it could be, and most, mostly. Well, what does, okay. So what do the guys say? Like what, well, bring, what brings them in to, to that go like, Hey, I heard about X, Y, like what do they want? So the senior guys, and I won't say the senior guys, but more so than 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 the young guys, they come in because uh, you know of the number one trigger, which is pain, right? So mm. you know they're playing at a high level club, they're obviously being paid well, but you know they're 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 not on the pitch; they're, they're just being on the treatment table, and it's sometimes fascinating. You have guys coming from big clubs. I won't obviously name them, but big clubs from. Croatia, Italy, sometimes Germany, you know, big clubs paying them loads of money. And, um, you know, they, they've got issues um, which are pretty standard for, for soccer players. But then, you know, um, and, and I'm not saying we're miracle workers, but, you know, come in, we go through an, a thorough assessment, we uh, give them some individualized resets. And like you said, you know, bang, you know, after uh, 10 or 15 minutes, you should be seeing some kind of change. And I think that's the sales pitch right there. And they're like, wow, this, you know, I haven't, haven't been able to open that hip up so much in, in like in a year. So like, okay, so you kind of try to explain to them why that is. And obviously you have to rem- remember that sometimes stuff won't work straight away. You, you have to refer them. And this is also why it's important to have a, refer- a referral network. And what's good in Vigor Ground in Ljubljana is that we've got some uh, manual therapists uh, at hand, you know, so I can send the guys straight down to Andraj and he'll work on them, bring them back up. And within a single assessment training session, we could do get some soft tissue uh, work in uh, and we'll get training in and then we'll have uh, the player at the end, you know, reassessing um, and also kind of debriefing uh, about what they've gone through. 
And usually that brings them in as a client, to, to be honest. And we've had people come in just for a normal assessment, kind of, you know, can you help me out with this? And then they've stuck with us for like five or six years, which is, mm. which is great. Um, and then obviously a couple of other issues that you have is, you know, they want to, they want to perform and then you, you you know get you get into the debate and often it's with parents and agents which is uh, sometimes quite frustrating about what performance is you know and a lot of the time it'll be the, yeah but they they need that first step you know the first step they need to be explosive i want you to work this and that you know and like, more often than not i'll try to not to roll my out eyes because it's just something that they think they've uh, hit upon but it's it's just general athletic development, to yeah. be honest. Um, I mean, the cool, the cool thing about it is that when, when things like that happen, you go like, that's exactly what we're going to do, right? Because you will. It's just, you, you're not, you, you're not, you don't need to tell them the modalities are going to get there, right? You, you kind of like, you tell them what they want and give them what they need. Um, and I think one of the things that I love to tell people, you know, if, if, you, if you are in coaching or anything like that, I'm, I'm always like, so if somebody feels better after the first session, if they got out of pain or something like that, like, okay, now we did that today. Imagine where you'd be if you train with us for six months or 12 months, right? If like, if after one session, 10, 15 minutes, whatever it may be, you're feeling better just because we found a bottleneck and we, we, we helped something get better. Imagine where you'd be. And then people like, the, you know, there's the power of, ma- of, 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 I would say the power of words and why I'm such a big, like fan of communication, uh, you know, understanding like communication is marketing, marketing is communication. Um, but also persuasion and, and the way that you communicate and talk because some people like they do the right stuff, but they don't communicate well. And then they go like, man, I don't understand why I'm not, you know, signing people up or, or it's not even just signing people up. Selling is like right now, if we have a conversation and I might have to sell you an, an idea, it's not even you giving me money. It might be just an idea. And to athletes, like you have to sell them ideas all the time. So you have to become good at communicating that or once again, like you not selling the idea, guess what? That guy goes goes and does whatever the fuck he's gonna do, and you don't. He doesn't succeed, you know. So, this it's so important that, you know, the the art of coaching has multiple layers to it, and one certainly is I think that is underutilized, and you know, in the strength and conditioning field, it's it's happening more and more, but it's it's, it's still like not happening enough, where people are learning communication, because sure you know how to do X Y Z, and you think this is best for them. But to get the person to actually do that, that's a whole nother world, right? And this is something that <clears throat> I talked about on the Mike Robertson's podcast as well, the power of language. Um, mm. And this is, I guess, where my knowledge uh, and understanding of different languages has come in pretty handy because you, you mentioned communication time and time again. And we talked about you know how you need to sometimes manipulate the level of communication, right? So it's a bit of a Machiavellian, Machiavellianism. Uh, when you talk about, uh, or rather with parents, agents, because sometimes you'll just, you know, have to say what they want to hear. And, you know, you you know what your job is, you know what you need to do, but, you know, you also know what they want to hear. And sometimes it's about driving them, guiding them in in the right direction. So I think over the years, I've been able to develop different levels of communication with different, I'd say, stakeholders almost, because it's, uh, like I said, it's either players already playing at a high level who don't really understand the strength and conditioning uh, terminology. It will be parents coming in who really, you know, sometimes, and this is probably a, a, a debate uh, in itself, but, you know, how, how they want their kids to succeed and, you know, they're, they're telling mm. you what to do and what they uh, uh, what they think the kid needs. And then, you know, you talk to the kid and it's a different conversation altogether. And then agents as well, you know, y- you know their interest, you know what they want, they want pretty decently faster results because they want the player to be uh, playing, you know, a level up or two levels up within a couple of months and they want to get their uh, commission and all that. Um, and it's sometimes it's uh, it's ridiculous the, the kinds of conversations I have. It's like, you know, they'll bring uh, a player in and, this, you know, again, this uh, experience I had uh, last winter. So you get a guy in who's like on the brink uh, of national national team senior national team and so it's the transfer window during the winter and so he'll call me up to let me tell you i've got this guy you know he's big strong defender but he lacks explosiveness you know uh his his uh his jumping's not what it's uh what it should be for this league and uh so you've got two weeks all right two weeks you know 
do, do you work? <laughs> and I'm like, yeah, all right, you know, okay, we'll get we'll, started. We'll, we'll get started. We'll fill them right up with some TRT and Vinstrol. Exactly, right you know. <laughs> so, and, you know, as long as you sit down with the player, explain, you know, be sincere and tell them that, look, you know, in two weeks' time, you're not going to, you know, you're not going to be jumping over, um, over 10 feet hurdles or anything, but um, that you're in <clears throat> here for the for the long game that you need, he needs to come back in the off season, get a proper like four to six weeks in uh, whatever time he has in the off season. <clears throat> and then we can start talking about results. Obviously it's a lot uh, easier working with the guys who are closer. So uh, <clears throat> all the guys in Slovenia, they'll come in in season. They'll be in, in the gym about twice a week and then uh, off season about three to four times a week. And the, big issue really is off season is managed or rather in season managing the load off season managing the recovery because they're usually coming in after a really long season they've got two weeks off maybe three weeks off and then they're coming in the, uh, to a pre-season training camp so where do you actually fit your work in that's the biggest challenge uh, for me personally so I've been playing around with different types of heuristics for, for the last five years or so. And look, it's a work in progress. Uh, I can't say I've figured it all out, but <clears throat> I've got a really good idea of how I think the training process should look. Obviously, if there's an SNC coach already within a club, I try to communicate with them. Um, this is something I'm really big about lately. So if I get a new player in, uh, I'll be like, look, does this, this your coach know that you're here? So the, the team coach, the, the sports coach, and does your SNC coach, if if you have one, know that you're here? And if the answer is yes, then yes, all right, we can get to work. If it's no, then all right, you know, you, you need to get them to call me or give me their number or whatever, because I don't want to start a training program, you know, without the the information that I need about the training load in uh, in the team setting, um, about stuff that they're doing in the gym in the club, you mm -hmm. know, because then all my work's just going to waste, I guess. It's a, I think that's so important. Actually, this actually kind of relates to any client, I'd say. Just in that, but with, with athletes, of course, like you have a whole nother, like what are they doing on the field, off the field, this, that, and the other. Obviously, you can communicate with the athlete about um, how much they sleep, stress, all this other stuff. But on, on the side of a, you know, for us, and I know it is for you too, like a client comes in and it's just like, okay, cool, this is what I want to achieve. But then it's like, you want to look at nutrition. Sleep is massive. Actually, uh, right now, I just, I just read through the book, uh, Why We Sleep, which is phenomenal. Just getting started on that, yeah. Phenomenal book, right? Uh, and, you know, you, you have this factor, like, for instance, sleep that with most people, just it, they're not, like, getting enough or it's not quality or whatever. I mean, that's a huge factor. And then there's stress and the environments that they're in, whether it's people or, um, you know, stressful areas, whatever it may be. Like, you got to look at all that stuff. To determine now, hey, what type of training program am I going to do? Maybe, you know, maybe they love running and they're running seven days a week to, to knock out the stress and you're making a four day a week strength training program for them. Doesn't make sense. So either way, I think more and more, you know, uh, you made some good points because it's like, hey, I'm not even going to start with them if I don't have some information um, to, to, to kind of get the bigger picture. It's a puzzle piece. And we got to, you know, I think the future of fitness and sports performance really is kind of you know, putting these puzzle pieces together. And, and, you know, sometimes it's just like if you can help this person recover, you know, and me and Joel, Joel Jameson always talk about this, you know, high performance recovery is like how, how to plug in these recovery modalities because few people overtrain, but most people under recover. Um, and, and you find those things out and then, you know, you get like, holy shit, like I'm, I've dropped, you know, weight and I haven't done it in so long and we are doing less or we're having them do more recovery work or more aerobic power work or whatever else it may be. Um, is to, to find out more. And I'd even say if you, if you're stuck, like in a training program, don't make, maybe don't look at it. Your training, look at all the other stuff. Uh, it's really, if, if you're in a field, it's really easy to focus on the things you're, uh, good at or the things that, you know, come naturally, um, versus, you know, something else that be, could become a complete clusterfuck. Um, so with, with that said, you know, talk a little, just a little bit about, uh, I'd say, you know, this model of uh, periodization. And, and, and to kind of plug this in, like when, we, when you look at training programs, I think this fits in well. Like you, you're going to talk more on the athlete side of things, but I think intuitive training, uh, you know, is kind of making more of, and more of a mark 
And even with things like group training, boot camps, and, you know, I remember back in the day when this, I would say the smarter programming was like building these four week blocks out. Right. Um, and to me, it never made sense because it was like, well, every week we have new people coming in to do our group training. Like the, that, that just doesn't make sense. So how do you create a model that's evolving the whole time by helping people get what they want? And it's the same thing. Like, you know, perfect example is one of our clients, Kimmy, for instance, um, she's a nurse. She, she was working night shifts sometimes, which, you know, when it comes to sleep and recovery, that's like the worst thing that you can do. But nonetheless, you know, she's really diligent. She's had amazing results here. Um, but you know, the program is like a lower body program and maybe there's some five RMs in there and three RMs and some high, you know, heavy lo loads. And li literally she's coming off of a 12 hour shift working overnight. I don't give a shit what the program says. I mean, you're going to have to adapt that. And so, you know, how do you kind of have some type of structure, some type of format, but at the same time, you know, keep it intuitive. So like, how have you gone about that? Uh, especially because like I said, I, I, I would actually say that pro soccer may be the, one of the hardest sports, um, to do that with, because why? I mean, in Europe, how long do they get off? It's crazy. Like it's, it's, so yeah. like, so th the Slovenian guys are the worst, right? So th uh, in the summer they'll break up on like June 1st and then they'll, get together two weeks later and then they'll start preseason. So just to, so just to, just to give like the, the, there's a two week off season. Think about this, right? Like literally you're done with training, right? And, and you have a two week break and then you start kind of preseason conditioning almost again. Um, because you're like, I mean, you're getting guys for like two, four week blocks. And I mean, more, more and more of them now are doing in season training, which, which, which you said, but, well, um, yeah, that kind of fixes that one. I mean, it doesn't fix it, but it's but it makes, makes it, better. it easier, makes it better, but yeah. makes it better. Yeah. Uh, actually the, the guys who I work with for like four to six weeks in the summer will be guys come in, uh, who are playing in Italy, who are playing in, in other leagues, you know, like maybe Germany or, or whatever, you know, because they have longer pre seasons uh, mm -hmm. or other off seasons. Off sorry. Season, yeah. yeah. Um, and then the, the, the domestic guys will be, actually it's really difficult to get them during the summer maybe i i'll, I'll say just guys you know that sometimes they want to train uh, straight after the season ends i'll be like look just go take a vacation a week or two whatever and then the pre-season starts and then when that's when we sit down and we say all right so they've just got a new coach and you know it's i'd say it's getting better and better but uh some of the coaches are still big into like you know beating them up in pre-season mm. so there's no real place for me at I would say, apart from what you talked about before, getting those um, recovery workouts in. So uh, we'll focus a lot on mobility, we'll, uh, maybe some aerobic stuff. But to be honest, you know, they're doing a lot of running anyway. So it'll be mostly mobility and maybe some tempo lifting, stuff like that. Real, just real easy stuff if you think about it. But, you know, stuff that these guys have not been exposed to yet. So it's it really is great to see how good they feel after these uh, types of workouts. And I just want to backtrack a little bit uh, by saying that it, I really uh, don't envy people uh, like strength and conditioning coaches getting into the business today if they're working with athletes because, you know, you have to show off literally in order to get your foot in the door, right? Um, you need to show, I guess, the marketplace that, you know, you're worthy, that you know something that some someone else doesn't know. And obviously the long game is not really sexy, right? So sitting down with someone and telling them, look, you know, you're not going to see <laughs> many results in the first couple of months just because you're not coming in like three times a week, right? And what's that, what, what is that saying to the athlete? So you need to you really need to learn how to basically choose your words and especially fit them to the athlete in front of you because a 17 year old kid won't basically be able to process the same kind of information as a as a seasoned you know veteran pro who's like 30 32 uh, whatever and i had an experience uh, about a month ago i uh, had a parent bring in uh, a small kid and uh, i actually don't usually start working with kids before the age of 14 or so uh, definitely i mean in a large group set and maybe if, if I get the whole team, but this was like a, you know, an assessment. And I, and I told him, you know, from the time, the moment we had a telephone conversation, I was like, I think he's a little bit too young, but bring him in and I'll, I'll, I'll assess him. I'll see wh uh, what he looks like. And he brought him in and the, the kid's a goalkeeper, 12 years old, very enthusiastic. Um, 
And I told his dad, you know, look, that the only way this is going to go down is if we do like one on one uh, training. And he was like, yeah, fair enough. You know, here's like 10 sessions uh, paid for. And um, and it's good because he sees the long game uh, and he's a, he's fine with us working once or twice a week for like for next year. And then we'll sit down after six months, maybe not before or and, and then after the next six months and we'll just do a review and uh summary and and you know see how we progress and i think that's the the way forward to be honest but coming back to the programming side of things is basically with the soccer players it's all in season definitely based off uh their scheduled game so if it's a saturday game it will always depend on you know how much time we have in terms of recovery so sometimes they'll have like saturday wednesday saturday so it really you know during that week we won't do any type of, of training other than like maybe a recovery session, maybe some tempo lifting like on the on the second day uh, after the game. Otherwise, if they've got like a Saturday, Saturday we'll we'll do normally a max effort. Um, it's and it's almost uh, always uh, full body. So say that will be on Monday or Tuesday, and then we'll have a dynamic effort uh, day on the Thursday. So two wait two days out from the game and and max effort can really be uh, different things right so like you mentioned uh, it can be in a 3rm 5rm even 8rm uh, stuff yep. like that depending on the level and i classify the the players into the level one level two level three whereas whereas level one are all the basically uh athletes who are really starting out who have a training age of zero or up to one and actually most of the guys who are coming in are at level like one that, yeah. and i'd say level three I probably have maybe out of the hundred guys I would train over the year, um, maybe like ten players at level three, and with level three I'll start doing some form of weightlifting uh, variations, but just like hand clean, uh, maybe some power cleans, um, dumbbell snatches, um, stuff like that. You know, uh, they'll all go through a dynamic um, effort day, but it will just be different modalities, different exercises. Uh, whereas, you know, we'll scale them to, to the level of the athlete and then obviously taking into account the the load in, uh, that they're exposed to in the club and then also uh, how far out from the game it is, uh, either T plus two or T minus two or, or whatever. Yeah, there's, there's, I know that you might, might, might talk about this, but there's actually not enough resources for people in soccer as far as... Um, this is my push for you to maybe make a product or something. Um. Yeah, it's, yeah, no, it's good. Uh, I'd say definitely. I mean, uh, I definitely have to mention Mladen Jovanovic's work. He's right, Mladen's he, awesome. Yeah. Mladen, Mladen does a lot of good stuff. Uh, I really recommend people uh, get online and check out his complimentary training. Is that, is that what's the site again? It's complimentary. Complimentary complimentary training dot net. I think it is. Uh, you could probably find it under dot com. I think it's complimentary training dot net. Um, and he's got some great resources up there. And uh, seriously, he's the his um, the subscriptions ridiculously cheap, to be honest. Uh, so a- anyone who's uh, looking to get in into strength and conditioning in soccer should definitely check out his stuff. Um, but also, yeah, definitely uh, another push for me to to develop something of my own. And um, I think it would be along those those lines for sure, like heuristics based approach, but basically breaking it down how you first of how all, first you basically of all, plug and play because you're great with words but what does heuristics based approach mean all right so Sorry. heuristics based approach is basically um a set of rules it's a rules of thumb that you use to organize your training right so just like i mentioned uh before it would be maybe t- um based on based on obviously several uh different elements but uh so in soccer uh when you had your last game, uh, how many minutes you played, and then obviously how m- uh, many minutes was uh, uh, or other training loads. So that would be an RP, like session RP, uh, in the last session uh, on the field, and then or and or in the gym, and we'll go off that uh, and use that as a kind of guideline to. So it's, it's basically a framework that helps you go. It's a framework. Yeah, this definitely. is where, it, and I, I like to call this like boundaries. Uh, I like the idea of, obviously, I play basketball, but it's just like a basketball court. You can dribble left, right, up, down, Definitely. but you have boundaries. And, and the heuristics approach gives you some questions 
which narrow down like, okay, this person should probably be somewhere here and it yeah. gives you a better guideline for it. But it's not a very templated, it's exactly this, because let's be real, that's just, that's, that's not. Yeah, like, and a, lo a lot of it is also subjective and uh, like in season, soreness will be a big thing. So like, you know, in season with the soccer guys, you really don't want to make them too sore. Not that they, they're pussies or anything, but you know, uh, hamstrings are a big issue. And then, you know, if you're doing like, big volume days of RDLs a couple of days in before a game I don't think that's the best uh, idea mm. although having said that you would probably have to do some of that work at the start of the week so maybe like that would be a max effort day would definitely be that might be like in a supplement or assist in a exactly yeah. Yeah, yeah so um and then I rotate the 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 cycles uh, are more like three week cycles uh, as opposed to like your standard four week cycles with the lower level guys, it will be more like six weeks. So we'll do a double cycle. And what this means is that we'll just, you know, keep the main lift as it is and do uh, j just change the volume and intensity of the supplementary work. Uh, because um, in season, we'll also do more like single leg stuff as opposed to um, bilateral. So, and we also, we, we won't really squat very heavy in season. A lot of this stuff, you know, would make sense uh, to, um, to uh, an experienced strength and conditioning coach, I guess. Um, but um, obviously there's several reasons uh, why we do it the way we do it. Probably um, don't have time to expand on that right now. Um, I'd be very happy to, uh, if anyone's interested in, in, in the minor, uh, finer details. Um, but yeah, there are a lot, a lot of single leg work uh, in season uh, and we'll go, we'll usually go quite heavy bilateral stuff during the off season. Mm -hmm. So if someone has a four week, um, off season we'll do like we'll get a, a squat cycle in there pretty pretty heavy but uh, even having said that most of the guys will be on a uh, double kettlebell front squat front yeah. squat yeah yeah yes, i mean funny the interesting thing is you know the 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 approach uh i would say is very similar to what we actually do with a lot of general population exactly yeah. because once again like you want them to feel great you don't want like unless you're going for powerlifting even even i mean I, even at, at this point in time, if somebody wants to build a bunch of muscles, like there's a ton of stuff we can do without doing a back squat, right? If uh, not to like say <laughs> back squat is evil or anything, it's just what's the better fit, you know, for that thing. But with going back to heuristics, I, I think everybody would do well. Ask even for, like I said, if you have a gym and your gym is general population, you're doing groups and so on and so forth. I think everybody would do well if you have a, a group of questions that guide you. Right. So meaning if somebody comes in and is, hey, this person has this issue, this issue, this issue, and you're automatic. I mean, we, ki we, we kind of do that with our groups. For instance, you know, if you can't pass a, an overhead flexion test, nobody's pressing overhead. Not that we're not going to get them there, but you're going to do core trainer presses. You're going to do, you know, bottoms up kettlebell work. Uh, we're going to do a lot. We have a lot of different options. You know, you're going to do a lot of horizontal pressing, a lot of reach stuff. Um, and but it's almost like that's that's heuristics to me right like you have a question it kind of guides you okay cool we're not doing any of that uh same thing like hey if you have any type of low back pain okay cool now we're gonna do uh possibly you know because it depends you categorize it but like you know single leg work or you know you're gonna elevate just narrow it down right yeah you're mm -hmm. narrowing it down and so so that even with group training our coaches know uh what the modifications are right and 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 i don't think that enough i would say businesses gyms have a framework for it that narrows stuff down you know and, and then because it becomes too much like oh well everybody is doing this and everybody is doing that um and i would say the same thing for uh, i'll give you an example so uh, uh, same thing for our semi-private clients um even like i said our group training clients if somebody comes in and they're a very sympathetic uh you know don't sleep much very high driven stress aka <laughs> like me like high strung person uh you know, giving them too much anaerobic work. We, we use a lot of aerobic power uh, and kind of like high, uh, high performance recovery training sessions as their, I would say, cardio. Because, you know, if anybody's got a resting heart rate above like 65 beats per minute in the morning, like you don't need to have a ton of more anaerobic work happening for you. Uh, that might hinder you more than, you know, and it helps you. And so I think that, you know, having those kind of frameworks, um, whether it's you know, semi-private personal training, whether it's group training, whether it's obviously athletes, that you got to start asking yourself those questions and creating um, 
frameworks that will help you, that will help you out. You know what I mean? Well, I'll, yeah, definitely. Uh, I'll say something that's more challenging for me than uh, programming for athletes is programming for the general population, especially, and you know, we've got several different programs in Vigor Ground in Slovenia. Uh, so I, I'm in charge of the programming for the body weight, uh, right? And it's it really is difficult because you're programming for large groups. You've got like, you know, 20 people uh, in the session and then y you're trying to scale everything. So it, sometimes it can be kind of difficult because, you know, these clients are after some variation as well. You know, it's it's very difficult to, to program a cycle where you're keeping the exercises constant, you mm. know. So that's been one of the most challenging things for me, to, trying to get constant feedback from the coaches how... Uh, certain programs are going, you know, how um, certain training modalities are going because I've been trying to expose uh, uh, our clients, you know, general pop. So during uh, 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 the um, bodyweight program to some, you know, low level uh, plyos, just basic stuff, you know, basic change of direction stuff, just stuff that I think they'll need when they go um, to basically perform their recreational uh, uh, activities such as you know five side soccer or or basketball pick up basketball whatever uh, they have and i think it's it really is our our job uh, as you know fitness businesses whatever you want to call us to to make our clients not just athletes but general population clients more robust because in Slovenia, as you well know, a lot of pe the people will have a lot of stuff going on outside of the gym as well, like mm. skiing, you know, hiking, um, five-a-side soccer, basketball, all these kinds of things. And I think we it's our job to prepare them for, for that. And we try to convey that. We try to uh, uh, to basically let people know that that's actually that, that that's why we're there, you know, to prepare you to go out and enjoy yourself during your everyday life, you know. Uh, when you're playing with your kids, you're going on a hike with your family or what have you, or playing with your friends. Um, but like I said, it's been challenging because uh, uh, sometimes we get, you know, we'll get in a, in a single session, we'll get like a, a 50 year old mum who's not really been exposed to any of that stuff. And then you've got like a former track and field, you know, athlete. So it, it's been challenging to try to kind of scale that and also keep it fun. Mm -hmm. So I've tried to really kind of pulled a line that, you know, definitely it needs to be fun and then try to get it, you know, keeping it uh, as diverse as possible without, you know, making every uh, session look different from uh, from the previous one uh, and the next one. Um, yeah, you made some good points because it does, I mean, look, look, we live in a day and age where I think that there's a lot of people got, there's two sides of this, right? The one side is do fucking whatever. Which is not good. It's like crank up the music. Do you know? To, to me, I'm a big fan of like you know what doing really smart training, having a why behind the things, um, coaching the shit out of it. Like that's a big thing. But absolutely, it has to be fun. So you know, finding kind of like the balance between that because the reality is like, look, I don't care if you're the smartest person in the world and you're coming in and it's boring or it's you know it's always it, it, it's always the same. And if the client goes like, man, we want a little bit more of you know uh, I don't know pump work guess what? Last 20% of the workout, like we're doing pump work. You know what I mean? Exactly. Because, Hey, and you want, you're, I'm the same as or like everybody else. You know, it, I mean, I look at my, my life now for training and somebody will go like, well, why do you, why do you do that? And I'm like, dude, cause I want to look jacked. Like I want to fuck it. You know, I'm going to finish my circuit with whatever I, because that's going to keep me coming back. If I'm, I'm working 15 hours a day, 16 hour days, I want to enjoy my workout. So I'm going to plug in things that are going to make me enjoy my workout. Our clients are just the same. So you kind of, you do a little bit of a give and take. And on that side of things, you know, I mean, if you have somebody that's you know, in their fifties, never done anything, how can I, you know, I'll, I'll, and I do these exercises, right? I write out continuums. What's the continuum for an explosive exercise? And, uh, you know, and something, and, and I don't think people write it out enough. Uh, and the continuum may be, you know, something that's so, you know, mundane to somebody but like hey that was going to be really explosive for this person you know or for reactivity like hey you know what for like older population we've done this before it's like throwing cards like and you know they have to react and catch the cards but like write that stuff out like i, I don't think enough people because if you do guess what you have a model for your team and you go hey here's like you know all these explosive exercises on a continuum from pure speed to you know to strength right 
and then here's your regressions um, and progressions. And, and, I, and I think not enough people do that. So when somebody does come in, you're not stuck going like, geez, should I, should I give high, like high knees for somebody is very challenging. Like, man, that's a very, very uh, high level movement. You know what I mean? There's a lot of force there that may have, they may have never experienced. Guess what? Like, how do I regress that? Right. Is it foot fire? How, how is it, is it, you know, uh, I would say leaning against the wall and doing punches. I mean, there's so many different things that you can do, but you gotta, you gotta be organized enough to, to know that beforehand. I think it's really important what you say, you know, writing stuff out on a continuum is, is a great idea. And, uh, so I also run the, the continuing coaches education in uh, Vicar ground and, and it's, it's been a great experience for me as well as the coaches because I get to learn from you know the, the interaction and the feedback uh, and the feedback loop that I uh, receive from the coaches, and it also shows me who's ready to basically um, get on this kind of heuristics uh, train with me because like the, my reality and I've talked to, uh, about this with Mike is you know sometimes we'll get like right now we're in August right. So late July, early August is when um, the the actual competition starts in Slovenia, like the, the, all, all the leagues. Uh, and then the guys will start coming back after their, you know, pretty heavy preseason. So, you know, they've not done much work in the gym. Now they're slowly coming back. So, but, you know, normally it will be like, they'll text me a day before. Can I come in and train tomorrow? I'm like, Okay. So, for instance, you know, when when I'm around, it's not a problem. You know, I've got my heuristics model. Yeah, uh, I ask the questions, you know, all right, so how, how much did you train yesterday? When was your last game? And then, you know, readiness questionnaire and all that kind of stuff. All right, I'm ready to, uh, to train with you. But then if I'm away, like I am now, I need my guys to, to know the heuristics, right? And, okay, you know, you might have them written down, but it's like, you know, so... I'm I'm really happy to have guys like Brane and Andraj who I'll say, all right, so this guy's coming in. All right, dynamic effort session today. He's at level, he's a th- level three. He's go- He's doing like um, hand clean. So this is something that I programmed for, for a guy today. He's actually in Ljubljana f- to play a European game against his former team, against Olympia. And uh, he's a very explosive athlete. Um, aerobically, he's very poor. So, and this will be two days out from a game. Mm-hmm. So it's going to be dynamic effort, 45 minutes, get in, get in, get out. But, you know, I want him to feel it. So like I said, you know, it was, uh, it will be some single leg hops, just basically power development stuff. And then some rotary power, um, some T-spine mobility. Um, and that's about it because he, he's a forward, you know, he needs the to change direction quickly and express that speed. He's pretty powerful. Um, one of the only guys who have done like, you know, you can work up to a hundred kilo, um, uh, power clean, which is for, yeah. So- yeah, for soccer, for soccer yeah. if, if any of you guys out there work with soccer players, that's kind of unheard of, at least in my world. Um, so, and, um, you know, the, the basic profile of a soccer player who I, uh, usually work uh, with when I get him, uh, for an assessment is, you know, they're just plain weak, you know, they'll, they'll be, they'll struggle to, to bang out like 10 or 15 good solid pushups and they'll struggle to high level ba- athlete, but that's high, yeah. high, high level, level athlete, athlete yeah. high level that's, athlete. Yeah. They may be playing for the national team mm. and then also maybe struggle to bang out like 10 nice, you know, goblet squats with, I don't know, a 32 kilo kettlebell. Mm-hmm. So yep. take that into perspective. So, you know, obviously you want to get those numbers up a little bit, especially form and, and all that. But then like um, lately, I think I've been focusing in a lot more on the mechanics. So obviously I don't take the players out onto the, the track and the stadium every day. But uh, lately I've been going uh, into more of a running form assessment, uh, like obviously change your direction assessment, um, acceleration assessment, breaking it down, the kilogram method uh, that was basically provided free by Altis, which is, I think, unheard of, is something that I've used to, uh, to a great extent lately. And it just kind of gives you insights into what kind of stuff you can do in the weight room to improve um, posture, form out in the field because 
I really like the way Stuart McMillan says it. You know, you've got to know the rules first before you can break them. Mm -hmm. And obviously, tr you know, training speed with a team sport athlete is completely different to a track and field athlete. But still, you know, you need to know the form. And I think one of the big things uh, for me was really uh, diving into to this um, speed training, especially uh, sprinting, posture, composure, um, all that kind of stuff that uh, I learned at Altus and, yeah, and they're just digging just, in a little bit deeper. Just to catch people up on is like Altus is like the best of the best when it comes to oh yeah, uh, uh, when it comes to training track and field athletes for speed. So they check it check it out and you know come back to it because you went out for what seven days nine days. Uh, yeah, it's their um, apprentice yeah. coach program ACP yeah. and yeah. they run one every three months or so. And I think seriously, you know, I, I I don't like to exaggerate too much, but that was one of the best coaching experiences for me in my life for sure because basically these guys allow you to get out on the track and just basically shadow them and this is like seven days a week you you go out on the track you you go through the training with them they'll explain everything they'll, they are completely transparent they don't hide anything they'll give you their like you know cycle so like i don't know a three-week training cycle mm -hmm. this is what this guy like uh the grass is doing like yeah. next three weeks in the gym and on the track. And w when I saw that for the first time, I was like, you're giving this stuff away? But it, you and I both know it goes way deeper than that. Absolutely, you can't just yeah. give someone a program and then, oh, and they, he, they know. He knows what you know. No, exactly. because it's like, I mean, Joel, Joel was even telling me that. I know you guys discussed it. I mean, like, like he, uh, you know, the coaches are watching the athlete run and then going, wait, stop, go on a table. And then somebody's doing soft yeah. tissue work literally in between coming back on the track and doing, and I think, you know, I just want extract kind of like a lesson here and some insight. I mean, number, number one, you know, uh, what I love about, I would say vigor ground in both, whether it's in Slovenia or here in the U S you know, we are obsessive about continuing education. Obviously you've traveled a lot, uh, some different models. I haven't been to Altus yet, but, uh, um, I know for, you know, you've kind of went to different areas where you're like, Hey, I think I can do best for my athletes. Um, but we're obsessive about it and like, man, going to the best of the best and learning this stuff. And what you'll usually notice is that the best of the best are very open with sharing stuff. Um, you know, and, and, and I, th I definitely know that like, this is the route that we've taken with, you know, obviously Vigor in Slovenia or Vigor here when people come in, actually, we just, uh, just had a coach come in yesterday, you know, hopped into our training session. I was like, man, just hang around, see what we do. You know, I think that's kind of giving back to, to the industry, obviously. Um, but to, to, you know, get like if you want to like, find out something in a certain area that somebody's doing the best, because that was an investment, right? I mean, it was. Uh, sure. I uh, mean, you know, together with the with the uh, with the plane ticket, you know, that was like fifteen hundred or maybe even two grand, you know. So and that's for a, for a week and probably more. But I was uh, lucky enough to to spend. Uh, uh, some time with my friend Mika, who, who lives oh, yeah, in Phoenix. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, I had accommodation taken care of. But I think sometimes people ask me, well, why are you, why are you going and spending all that money just like to do that? But like you, like you already said, you know, if, if you want to work with the best, you have to learn from the best, right? And then uh, following on from that, you then have to apply uh, what you've learned. So Altus was, the, the Altus experience was eye-opening for me f for sure. And also the the way they... Uh, like you know really focused in dialed in about the finer details and you know every kind of warm-up is, is a screening process for them and then dan paff one of the best coaches yeah dan paff that does that's uh who joe was talking about that dan was yeah. like and it's I, incredible like he the way just they, saw stuff that i i couldn't see and it's something that i and i understood straight away look you know this is this is a guy who's got like 40 years of experience like I don't know how many Olympics he's he's been at, you know. So obviously you can't really compare yourself to him. Uh, but it was just like you know him pointing out what he saw and during the uh, just a regular routine warm up. And I was like, okay, I see. So he's trying to get you to uh, to see the bigger picture, not just uh huh. Now you're going to watch the ankle and see if you know if it's uh, flexing enough uh, or whatever. But you know, he's trying to get you to see the bigger picture, right? Mm -hmm. Look, focus on the movement. What do you think? What you th what, what do you think is off? And obviously, uh, for you to know what's off, you need to know the athlete. You can't mm -hmm. do that on day. Well, you can do an assessment on day one, 
but you've got to build a relationship. You've got to see the guy doing all kinds of movements. And obviously in a team sport setting, it's maybe even a little bit more difficult because there's so many more movements uh, that are possible. Um, so for me, it's uh, what this means is trying to get out there, which is kind of difficult because obviously time restrictions and all that and logistics, but trying to get to see as many matches uh, where my guys are playing uh, because uh, more often than not, I think the strength and conditioning coaches will be like, you know, they'll get the guys in the weight room, uh, get in, get out. And then, all right, so how'd you do? Uh, you know, they'll tell you the results, whatever. No, I, I want to see how the guys are moving out in the field, you know, and then, uh, I told, uh, talked about this, um, with Mike as well. You know, some of the guys, uh, lately been, um, sending me videos of, you know, drones filming them. So mm, in yeah. Italy, they've already got that kind of stuff set up and they'll just ask me like for, for my opinion about, and then, you know, uh, and then I'll just give them a, just a couple of things that I think they, they should work on in terms of, uh, movement. I don't know, maybe change the direction, speed, all that kind of stuff. And it, it, it's fascinating that, you know, they don't really build a relationship within the clubs uh, more often than not. So I'm their kind of number one uh, resource, you know, source of information. So that, to me, it was actually quite interesting. But, you know, I, I try to um, kind of act really responsibly on, uh, on the amount of information they provide to me and also the amount of trust they actually uh, have when it comes to their relationships with me. Mm. so yeah i mean uh what did we leave off uh, well put it this way let's, i, I want to switch gears because yeah. we've we've go, we've gone through some stuff and i would be a disservice to to not talk about this because uh you're an avid traveler one of the things i didn't mention before is like you know you talked about uh starting a translating agency and um i mean one i, I think I don't know if this still stands. You're like the youngest court justice translator in, in, in Slovenia ever. Like yeah, I passed that exam when I was 23. So I think it still stands. I haven't, to be that's honest, I haven't gone back and checked the records, but I've been, yeah, it's, that was way that's, back. That's just, just to know, like that's a very, very, very challenging thing to do. And now you speak how many languages fluently? Six, I'd say. Six, six. So, but just, they, to they, just to remind the listeners that Lucas first employment came at Translinguist, my translation. Absolutely. Agency. So just I, to, I've I have worked everywhere you can imagine. And I, well, sh I should I, I was bottom, running your, I was here. I was running your company while you were away in Brazil for like a month. Uh, yeah, every time. that's true. So that's, that's true. He he, um, he he held a fort really well. I have to so, say. But but you know, with, with that said, like you've been now to how many countries? Well, I actually stopped counting, but I think it's about 60 right now, 60 plus. Um, so yeah, I've still got quite a few to go because uh, last time I checked, uh, so, I mean, th I mean, this could certainly be a, a separate show in itself, which we'll, we'll have to do, um, ab about the travel part, but you know, just like, because I, you give, you know, one of the things that we always talk about is that, um, you know, you, you enjoy life. Um, we, <laughs> I always had always argue you got to be, uh, on, on my side of things, I probably need to do some things uh, more like you and you probably need to do some things more like me. Exactly. Um, uh, but, but there's, there's a lot of lessons learned cause you, you piss me off sometimes. And I, you know, I, I tell you that, to, uh, directly, but, but at the same time, there's, there's a lot of things that I've learned from you as far as, you know, taking time off, taking trips, enjoying life. Uh, and, and everybody that, that knows, you know, you and me and that knows you will say like, Hey, you know, like this guy really doesn't give a shit sometimes he'll just go and uh and like man he he knows how to take a break and and uh and really enjoy what he's doing but i i actually i just want to i want to get your kind of insight i don't know maybe the top three to five things of uh just overlying like hey why you know why do you travel so much uh you know what does it mean to you um how do you and, and I'll, I'll make a point first too what i mean like matei spends a lot of you know his the, like the, the the money that he earns investing in learning and you know and traveling like these experiences um more so and, and like i've i've done a lot of that in my life uh i would say he does even more on, on the side of travel and experiences he does even more because people say like man luca you travel so much like i don't know anybody who travels more than you i'm like eh, my brother travels more than me <laughs> but you know where, where does that come from? And like, what's your thought process around that? Because I, I, I do think it's a very powerful lesson. You know, when we talk about, uh, you know, what matters in life and, and, and more so than ever, you know, for me, it's like becoming the best at, you know, meaningful work. Um, it's about 
people that you love and creating those great, amazing relationships that, you know, you, you'll have forever and in creating experiences with, the, with that. Uh, and also, uh, being, I'm, I'm a massive fan of Anthony Bourdain. Um, I was really sad to hear that he passed away. I'm like really, really sad. Like this is my favorite show on TV. But, you know, the things that he said is like, you know, traveling. Uh, he said, when you travel, even though you're traveling outside, you're really traveling inside of yourself. That it's like a, it's a, it's a journey of personal development. And I would, ag I would agree with that, you know, um, beyond just going like, hey, I'm going to a place. It's cool. I've seen all this stuff. I can tell people about it and put it on Instagram. But, um, you know, give me like top, you know, uh, the top three to five. I would say reasons and, and uh, why people should travel and like why you do it and, and what does it do for you? Well, not for me, number one, I guess, um, is, and it will be different for everyone, but I think number one for me is definitely curiosity. I just, you know, look at the end of the day, and I'm not going to go too deep into philosophy right now, but I mean, we're only here once, right? So, and there's so much out there to explore and, I don't know, curiosity just got uh, got me going. And then, you know, I, I traveled to Brazil in 2004, um, just uh, a couple of months after I'd split up with my then girlfriend, that kind of triggered it. And then I was just curious, you know, and I, every time I went to, to a place, I tried to be kind of, I don't know how to say, just show my respect to that to that place and try to learn the the language or if not if it was if that was too difficult in that short space to, of time at least know something about the culture know th something about the customs of of the place and uh try to fit in a little bit not not act as a tourist res show respect to to the people that you're interacting with and um yeah w once i got the ball rolling uh i think the you know the the to be honest you know the the translation work was a was a means to an end right it was it was there it was obviously you know it, it paid well but it helped me besides uh setting up a big ground along with you and and giga was uh, was to travel the world and see all these wonderful places and everywhere i went you know i had a slightly different experience but you know a lot of the times that there were similar things that I took away, similar lessons. And a lot of it was like humility um, and also about how you kind of sometimes have to work for people to understand you, right? So, um, and that may mean different things to different people. But for me, it was learning Portuguese before I went out to Brazil because um, I, I went out for a month and I was there on my own for the first, I don't know, like, you know, um, I'm in a relationship now after like 13 14 years but before I was always traveling on my own so um, I had to kind of you know take care of myself Brazil what as they told me was kind of a dangerous place which is not mm -hmm. and so I just found the the people there to be really warm and when they saw the effort I made to speak their language the the feedback I got was something that you know I, um, I just can't really express you know I met so many people who then became my friends who I don't think I'd even have met if I didn't speak the language. So uh, that just kind of, you know, set the ball rolling. So after that, uh, I kind of, you know, stuck with South America because I found the the warmth of the people and, uh, you know, they were really genuine. There wasn't really m many people there trying to, to please you um, just because, you know, you're, you're someone from Europe and, uh, you know, you're traveling and you may have money to spend there. But... Uh, yeah, so that got me going into places like Argentina, uh, Chile, Colombia, basically all, all around South America. And, and then also places where I didn't feel, you know, I, it wasn't my first port of call, but places in the Middle East like uh, Syria, which is, you know, now very sadly been devastated by, by the war, um, Lebanon, um, Jordan. Uh, all these types of places then onto the other side of the world where we actually met so australia new zealand uh, and all these places but it was always driven by curiosity and i always brought something back to 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 my work so the training process the coaching how to basically influence people how to to talk to people to communicate uh, with people and i think that's probably the biggest takeaway has been that but you know you you mentioned why i, I did it. it was mostly uh curiosity and I, I remember reading malcolm gladwell's book i think it was curious mind or something like that um and he talks about and and i thought when i was reading that but he doesn't really say anything but 
you know, uh, any anything specific, but I th- think the whole idea behind curiosity is is what kind of basically helps the the human race move move forward, right? Is because we're curious, we want to we want to find out something more, we want to get better at something. Uh, and, you know, then in this profession, hopefully you're in it f- uh, in order to help other people as well, to help other people. Um, and, you know, obviously then that kind of fills you up with positive en- energy and, and so forth. So um, for me, it's not even about like having a bucket list to, to cross off. Uh, it's, I don't know, just being curious. And lately I've been trying to get out more to places where this pristine um n- you know uh, nature so where the environment's still kind of intact so antarctica is a place i really want to visit um i'm really into into animals uh lately so it was fascinating to go to hawaii right now and, and swim with the with the green turtles that was really nice um just seeing them in their pristine habitat that was really cool and again you know showing respect and not disrupting the wildlife um kind of brings it back to like the the social media stuff uh because you know you, you, today everyone's trying to post something and look i'm here i'm i'm, I'm doing this and that uh, and i'm guilty of it as well but uh just trying to be respectful and uh, trying to show I, I mean more of the educational side of things uh, rather than kind of boasting or or portraying uh, an image of yourself that you may not even be you know in in real life I mean, virtue, one of the greatest virtues, curiosity, I would say. And I, I keep saying this. I actually said this many a times that people like humans would be better human beings if they traveled more. And more so than anything, I think it, it connects the world because, you know, I, I'm, I'm very grateful that we did from a young age. We traveled quite a bit, you know, and our dad, like, would you know, even when we go to work, we'd go to France, we'd go to Paris, we'd go to Germany, we'd go to all these different places. Obviously, we lived in. London from the time we were seven, exposed to a lot of different ethnicities, cultures. And, and uh, I'm grateful for that because I certainly know that kind of uh, wiped out certain things such as, you know, uh, racism or, or you know, and, and, and I, I say like, hey, look, get everybody in the U.S. or anywhere in the world to travel before they're 18, spend the money you spend on wars, doing on that. And like, man, you'd be doing a humongous shift in and human consciousness and, and how we uh, look at each other and how we're very much the same, but, but so much, you know, even though we're so much different, we're very, very much the same. And the more that you go to these other places, uh, this was one, I, I, I'm not going to say this word for word, right? Probably. Um, but Anthony Bourdain says something like, Hey, you know, you go, you go somewhere and you know, somebody sticks a camera in your face and like, you're like, ah, but if you, you know, you're not going to tell them the truth or, 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 or share like your, your, uh, like, I, I guess your truth with them, right? But you sit down with somebody and you eat a home-cooked meal and you ask them some questions and all of a sudden, like... They you open got, up, right? They open up and you got a friend and, you know, it becomes one of the best experiences ever. Um, and, and you know, it takes me back to, like, what's an, like, what's an ideal scenario? Uh, it's like, you know, when... when uh, this a couple of years ago. Mike Robertson was in, in town. Nate Reeves was, was in town. Shelly was in town. And, you know, we're doing the seminar and we're hanging out and we end up going for, you know, some hikes by the river Socha. And then we go to, you know, House of Franco uh, and have this unbelievable meal together. And, you know, it's all from like it's a zero kilometer restaurant. So all the food is from there uh, and, you know, like literally from within like a mile or something like that. And we're just eating and, and sm- laughing and, you know, <laughs> crying because the damn meal was so good. But to me, that's it. You know what I mean? Like going somewhere, experiencing that place, experiencing the people, sharing that. If you're from there, you know, sharing that because that people love to share it with others. Like, man, this is where I'm from. Like, this is our food. This is what we do. This is right. And um, I think a lot of life is about that. So for me, it's like work as hard as you possibly can at meaningful things and become the best that you, you can at it, you know, for, like fulfill your potential in that area. And then, you know, share one share that knowledge with others and then share experiences with the people you love going to other places and, and sharing foods and 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 uh and i'll say sights and sounds and i mean that's a pretty good kind of wrap up of like yeah you do just, those things and yeah and i just like to add in one other thing that kind of hopefully will will get me to you know kick me in the butt to to finish a, a project that i started and which you participated in uh 
Oh, this, ultimately, yeah, this yeah. is absolutely like yeah, this is so my this is my cue. Yeah, to, so this for, is for you to, to give year, you shit so about it. Yeah, I've, I've um, I just uh, started. I'm uh, not just started. Just finished the first year of my master's uh, degree, so that's kind of you know uh, an excuse, but it's not really. I mean, um, for for the project that I started last year. So the curiosity that I was talking about before um, in terms of traveling uh, got me thinking about what would be unique to me my skill set and and my curiosity how could i package that into something that i could i don't know show the world or i don't know if eventually prob- maybe even make it into a product as, of some kind but more or less it was it, it was designed more of, as a social thing to to get more kids uh, into training and uh, also help um, kids in uh, underprivileged areas so i was thinking about how, how you know what am I, what, what's my skill set? All right. So languages, travel, movement, uh, training, all that kind of stuff. And then I came up with the idea of, um, of movement culture. So basically going to different places around the world and just studying, uh, and documenting the movement culture, why they, you know, the certain forms of movement and, and training and exercise and all that kind of stuff is, um, uh, is basically uh, characteristic of a, of a certain place uh, or locality. So, uh, I came up with with about six different destinations, and actually we went to one. So Rio de Janeiro was my first port of call because I've been there many a time um, because of my affiliation to jiu-jitsu over the last uh, four years and my friendship with Carlos uh, Maia, my, my professor, uh, my jiu-jitsu teacher. So we went there last year, and Luca uh, came along graciously uh, and uh, helped me out, and we, we banged out this, uh, what ended up being like about a 20 minute documentary which i think is really valuable but i haven't basically put it up uh, online yet because i thought straight after that we'd be going into uh, another one and another one and actually um had an opportunity to go to iran and then kenya but because my uh, obviously some uh, uh, some of the issues were financial and then uh, some of them were just black lack of time really so hopefully this year and next year we'll, we'll start working on the next episodes and uh, Luke has already started helping out me out uh, setting up a landing page for, for my project. So as soon as it's up, uh, I promise I will promote the shit out of it. And uh, hopefully Luke will help me do that as well because it's for a good cause. When we actually put it up, we'll try to mm-hmm. get some funding uh, for um, for gyms and outdoor gyms to be to be installed in the impoverished areas that we visited, like favelas in, in Rio. And also not forgetting the uh, local uh, i'll be setting up a a program training program for underprivileged kids uh, back home um but like i said i need to make the first step and, and put this stuff online because i think we actually the whole team did a really really good job it was, it was fa- phenomenal and it, i mean it was a uh, and just to kind of do a, like a quick snippet of it, it you know basically we we kind of went and uh, experienced as much like what's what's movement culture in those areas so i mean we did everything from jujitsu to, uh, you know, even boxing in the favelas, which was fin- like, that was actually one of my favorite stories that I really want to share, um, to surfing, to, uh, gymnastica natural, to like rock climbing, to, I mean, it was, it was, uh, it really was great. And I, like, that's why I've, I've been pushing him to, to put the stuff out because it's, um, and this was completely like self-funded just so everybody knows, like, I mean, on our dime, you know, uh, yep. <laughs> uh, so, you know, and having some of like phenomenal photographers and, and videographers with us, uh, which certainly, like I said, wouldn't, wouldn't be able to be, uh, to happen if we didn't have some of that relationship there. Um, but once again, like I'm, I'm pushing to get it out because I think that if, if, if we get it out, like you'll be more fired up to go do episode two. I definitely want to, uh, you know, uh, and I want to go to Japan. I think we should go to Japan together too. So that's, that's a cue. Uh, to do the documentary there with that said i mean we could keep going for for quite a bit but uh uh tell them a little bit more like what because i i want to push you to do more stuff on social media as far as sharing uh the one sharing travel but uh, also sharing your knowledge on the side of the sports performance for soccer um but just tell them where they can find a little bit more about you well i think lately it's instagram mostly i've really kind of uh, left facebook uh on, on one side i don't know if for some reason instagram has been uh, has become uh, the favorite uh kind of uh, social medium for me even though i don't actually post uh, as much and it's always like a, a kind of a uh, 
struggle inside of me about how much to post and how much to keep to myself because I think like the some of the some stuff should just I don't know just need to be kept yeah private, we'll, 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 yeah we'll talk about that you need to get over that shit yeah. um. <laughs> <laughs> no no seriously I, uh, I try to post stuff that I think is meaningful anyway that, that's what I wanted to say and I I will try to post more and the um what is my uh Instagram all right it's uh Hotcha Dervish so uh you, you can put it on in the show notes. I'll, and, I'll put it in the show and notes. And just follow me. And sometimes I come up with some some cool stuff. Um, obviously, I'm not as frequent and as regular as Luca, but uh, I promise I'll give you some we're, stuff that he doesn't. All right. We're, so. we're, we're, <laughs> we're, we're getting them there. We're getting them there. Yeah. We're, and, we're, then, and then I'm uh, definitely thinking about in uh, in the next year or so coming up with a, uh, a soccer specific um, product for coaches and athletes alike. So. Uh, I'm not sure exactly what kind of uh, format it'll take, but it'll definitely be something uh, where you have direct interaction with me, not just uh, some PDF that you can download online. And it'll probably be limited to uh, a certain amount of people, especially the the product that's going to be aimed at coaches. For the athletes, probably be a bit more um, general in nature, but also uh, with some... Um, uh, back office support, so to speak, uh, from me. Okay. And I got, you got to kind of build you because I can always run this shit back and send it to you. So yeah. Good stuff. <laughs> I appreciate you being on the show. All right. Love Thank you, man. You. Um, with that me. said, guys, you know, once again, if you, if you love the podcast, you already know, please go to iTunes and review it. It means a ton. Uh, you know, it's how we get to, to share it, spread it, and uh, get this info out there. I will see you in the next episode of the Video Life Podcast. Coach Lucas out. Peace.